Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome um, to our online devotion. Today, we're going to take a look at John chapter 7, the gospel of John chapter 7. So if you'd like to open up with me, uh, we're going to go on a little journey here. And I'll set the stage for what's going on as people join us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, at this point in John, we're still months away from the crucifixion, but the tension is building. And gathered, there's two, real, there's two groups that oppose each other with Jesus, whether they realize it yet or not. There's two movements building. Um, there's the people who are for Jesus. They're the ones that are going to shout Hosanna on Palm Sunday. Um, they're the ones who are starting to believe and see his miracles. And they're part of his, his following. But the people inside Jerusalem are influenced by the high priest. And the high priest has a very different take on Jesus. Um, he's revealed his plot earlier in John that he wants to kill Jesus. He's created this, this self-fulfilling prophecy that Jesus will be killed. It's very interesting when you look at it. Read through the Gospel of John and you'll see it. Um, Jesus knows all of this, okay? And what's going to happen is... Let's, first, we'll look at verse 33 here in John chapter 7. He says, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? Okay, so Jesus knows this. He knows that this following is building, but also that his opposition is building. And so he knows that he's going to die, okay? So we have this self-fulfilling prophecy from the high priest that Jesus is going to die. Jesus has announced that he's going to die. And yet he's not going to try to stay under the radar at all. He's going to do what he came to do, even if it stokes the fire a little bit more, okay? So he is at the Feast of Tabernacles, three major feasts. Uh, there is Passover, uh, there is Pentecost, and there is the Feast of Booths. Okay, Now, um, some scholars say that because big things happen on Pentecost and big things happen on Passover, Jesus will come again on the Feast of Booths. We don't know that. There's nothing to tell us that. It's just an interesting take by some scholars. Um, on what happens here in this ceremony is there's a ceremony where the priest would walk down with the people to the pool of Siloam, chanting hallelujah psalms all the way. It's the highlight of the week. Okay, Everything's been building this. It's this intimate moment where the priest is walking down, leading the people to the pool of Siloam. They're chanting hallelujah psalms along the way. It's a special time. And at the pool, the priest would fill this large golden pitcher with water. And then he would lead the crowd back to the porch of the temple. And he would pour out the pitcher in front of the people, commemorating God providing in the wilderness. Okay, And then reading aloud, he reads Isaiah 12, 3. Therefore, with joy, you will draw from the wells of salvation. Okay, So this, this has all just happened. This has been read. And what happens next is a little shocking. Jesus is there and he's watching. <laughs> and this is what he says in verse 37. It says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So in this intimate, quiet moment, everybody's watching this picture and this scripture is read. Jesus says, that's about me. I'm fulfilling it. Hey, everyone over here, look over here. That's about me. You can imagine how that sat with the, the priests. You can imagine how that sat with the people who did not like Jesus, that he just ruined this big feast, this ceremony, this great moment that everything was leading up to. And he claimed it was about him. And of course, if they didn't believe in him, then they really thought he was a heretic and yet the people who are following Jesus, their wheels are starting to turn, right? About these connections that Jesus is making for them. It's a, it goes on to say, now, this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. 
For as yet the Spirit had not been given before Jesus was not yet glorified. <coughs> okay, so what's going on here? Um, Jesus has talked about water before in John 4, living water. He talks about living water with the woman at the well. That he is the source of living water. He is the source of uh, qu quenching for our thirst that won't leave us wanting more. He, he is what we want. He's not the cheap imitation of everything that we chase. He's the living water that truly gives us life. And so here he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's promising to give the Holy Spirit to all who believe, which means he is claiming to be the Messiah. Okay, We get all that. But that's the connections that the people are, are making at this point. And these two themes for water work together, the Holy Spirit and eternal life. One leads you to faith in eternal life, right? The Holy Spirit leads you to faith, which brings you to eternal life. Our faith is a free gift. Our faith is not our own. Nobody comes to Jesus on their own. God draws them, okay? So it's a gift from the Holy Spirit. But then, with that gift, it's our responsibility to share our faith, so, if we think about this story today, Jesus stood up in the face of humiliation. He didn't care. And in the face of assassination, which eventually he was, um, and stood for the truth out of a heart to set us free. Okay, He stood up against these cultural norms out of a heart to set us free. He stood up against the lies out of a heart to set us free. He revealed the truth, even though it cost him, because that truth... In him sets us free. So how do we respond? Well, it's that same Holy Spirit that empowers us to be bold for the gospel, just as Jesus was bold. And this is an important story to remember when we're in a situation where we're afraid to stand up or step out for Jesus. You've probably been in one of those recently, right? A discussion came up that you didn't agree with because it wasn't biblical. A discussion came up about the world that, that wasn't very Christian and you were maybe a little bit afraid to interject for Jesus. The Holy Spirit is what allows us to do it. We can't do it on our own. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do that. And so we can stoke those fires by being in the word. right? We can stoke those fires by praying for God to give us that bold spirit of faith. To stand up for our faith in this world. Knowing that Jesus did for us too. Let's pray. God, thanks for our time together today. Uh, thank you for your word that just blesses us, Lord. We're, we're just blown away by all of the connections that you make in Scripture and how everything just points to you, Lord. And let us see the world that way. Let us see our lives that way, that everything that you're doing in our lives and in the world is going to point to you and we can be a part of it. Help us to boldly proclaim that, Lord, as we are thankful that we have the ability to talk about our faith because it comes from you. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And that means that the Holy Spirit has created faith and that our faith gives us eternal life. We're so thankful for that gift. So let us be bold for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God's blessings, everybody. Take care. Have a great day. Um, if you want to know more context to that story, read John 1 through 7 today. We'll see you soon.